fortunate enough to grow this into an empire that, that ranged from Queensland to New South Wales down to Victoria. More of a person that sits there and, and spies and, and watches it. But good. Once you made this decision, was it hard to deal uh, with this new environment? Reach for Ricola, he pulled out the last five dollar note that he had and I was I was a hundred percent sure that's all he had. Like you've been threatened by these people, um, they're challenging you on a day-to-day -day basis or you just we start to think that even in the conflicts between countries that, that plays a part and that can have really dire uh, consequences on you think Australia plays a role in um... I was, you know, a very poor person. Some people are content with just dreaming and talking about their goals, while others set clear targets and actively work towards achieving them. Once they have achieved a particular goal or reach a certain level of success, the first question they ask themselves is, what is next? I am your host, Roland Leyun, and today we have a truly remarkable guest with us, Emil Neida, an entrepreneur an inspiring entrepreneur who fearlessly embraces new ventures. Emil is also a father of a beautiful family and a fantastic friend that I'm so proud to have. Emil, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Rob. Before we start our conversation today, let's take a moment to introduce ICT Group, specializing in IT services to our viewers, one of the businesses that Emil owns and operates. I'm the owner and CEO of ICT Group, uh, we are a Telstra partner. ICT Group specializes in end-to-end -end solutions, IT and telecommunication solutions for our clients. We've got a team of people who are highly skilled and experienced, and they range, their capabilities range from uh, uh, pre-sales engineers, network engineers, Cisco engineers, IT consultants, delivery managers, project managers, so it, we, we cover the whole scope of IT services. Emil, let's go back in time. Tell us about your family, the neighborhood where you grew up, and of course your time at school. Okay, so we migrated here from Lebanon in 1977. My parents um, lacked the skill to, to start work in various fields, so they were forced to work in factories. and and that coming from my father who was in the army overseas and my mother who was a housewife. So migrating here, they, they worked in factories and worked very hard in order to support us. They, they couldn't speak English, so that way it made it a lot harder for them. They put us through school and, and, and again, worked very hard to, to make ends meet. There were, there, there's a few stories. There's a story where my, my father was, after working night shift, he, he'd come home and then drive me to school. Uh, I was in high school and he, he drove me to school and then reached for his wallet. We, when he reached for his wallet, he pulled out the last $5 note that he had. And I was, I was a hundred percent sure that's all he had in his wallet. And he did you ask that. him? Did you ask him back then? Or you, do you still remember this time? Like specifically? No, my dad passed away. Uh, 11 years ago and no I didn't get the chance to ask him and I don't think he would have recalled it the way that I recalled it because I mean as a child you you see your parents in a different way and I guess maybe there's also the fact that he might be ashamed of the fact that he couldn't you know provide as much as he would have liked but I didn't feel that he ever was short on providing us and and so yeah, pulling out that last five dollar note. Back in those days, payday was, was Thursday, and we were only either Monday or Tuesday. So I thought, okay, my dad's going to be walking around with no money in his wallet. He's a factory worker. Mm. What if we want needed milk for the house? But they may do, and I guess it's from that time onwards that I I made a promise to myself that I'm going to put that extra effort and commitment in order to give them a better life than what they could do by themselves to your parents to my parents that that was that was my goal that was the uh, as far as i can recall that was the first goal that i really set in my life and and it was a it, it was a driver because I, I i would see them waking up early in the cold hours of the morning to go to work or come back from work and and yeah it was it was a hard thing for them to do but we were blessed enough that 
I mean, they put me through school. Um, I went to university. I got a degree. Whilst I was getting my degree, I, I had two jobs because my degree was a sandwich course. So I would go to uni from 12, 12 hours once a week, one day a week, and I had to work in the field for four days. So after the, you know, office job of 8.30 till 5, I'd drive down to the service station. 5.30 I would start and I would finish at 11 o'clock. That was during the weekdays and weekends. I would work extremely long hours in order to be able to save and give them a better life. So that was that was my childhood. It was a great childhood. They, uh, my my parents were great. My, you know, we again we back then. I guess we never lived beyond our means, and um and yeah, life life was different. Right. Let me just dig a bit deeper on your relationship with your dad, because obviously uh, your dad, who passed away, played a major role in your life. Do you want to talk a bit more about your dad and the image that you still have in your? Look, my my dad was a very nourishing man. He 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 showed us love. He's the one that brought us up with love, um, and yeah, and sadly. In my teenage years, up to the age of 28, 29, I didn't have much to do with my father because I worked very hard and long hours. So we do had that disconnection. Do you regret that I, you haven't spent much with look, your dad? Again, I never have regrets because out of that sacrifice of not being with my father, it allowed me to be able to provide for them a lifestyle that they couldn't afford. Yeah. So we were blessed in that respect and, and it helped. Not that my father ever asked for anything. You, you know, I, I bought my first car, my first brand new car, drove it home and I was living with my parents back then, parked behind my father. My father had an old car and I, I just realized to myself, what the hell? Why am I driving a brand new car and my father isn't? So I walked inside and handed my father the keys and said, here's the keys to your brand new car. I had literally just driven it from the dealership, gave him the keys to his new Mercedes Benz, and he didn't want it. He didn't. He just said he's content with what he's driving. He's happy as long as I'm okay, and I wouldn't accept. So the deal was that you know I give him my car keys, he gives me his, and and we did that until you know I can go off and afford the second car and go from there. So he was very content in that way. I guess then once once my father retired, he became very ill. He um, got cancer, and and then yeah, and that's when I was I I stepped up and and had the amazing experience of looking after him for the last six months of his life. Um, my sisters chipped in, my brother chipped in, but I would. Every time we take him to hospital, because he, he'd go through phases where he's conscious and then he becomes unconscious, we take him up straight up to the hospital and then, you know, he stayed there for a couple of days. And I would, I would stay there and sleep with him at the hospital. The nurses were great. They generally don't allow anyone to stay there. But because I was doing everything for him, whether I was showering him, changing his bed, cutting his nails, whatever, these guys were happy with that. And, and honestly, Roland, that was to me, I think I achieved more than what I'd want in my life. And that's, that's very important to me to be able to give back, to be able to have that connection with him before he passed, to be able to make sure he was comfortable. He didn't have any strangers looking after him or, you know, uh, bathing him. That was very important. And, and, and he felt that and, I got his blessings on a daily basis, and that's very important. So what was the major lesson that you learned of your dad and you'd like to pass it to your kids now? Life life is is a journey. Life is not about how quickly and how much you can accumulate. Life is about sharing experiences, giving people opportunity, having a go. Um, yeah, but it's not about how much you can accumulate, how much wealth. That doesn't mean anything. It's just a matter of enjoying the life, whether it's the simple things, whether it's beyond, you know, the simple things could be beyond a lot of people's minds. But it was, you know, a basic picnic that we used to go on. I remember till this day. It, it, it's, it has that profound impact on me. Whereas, you know, these days you can, 
you talk to your children, say, let's go on a picnic. They'll think, what's that? Where, where, you know, is there Wi-Fi? Is there technology? What, what, what's there? You can virtually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I think he taught me that, you know, again, it's, it's the quality of life. And that's what matters. Look, uh, I sincerely believe that wherever he is now, he's watching you and he's so proud of you. So you've done really well, Emil. Um, just going back to your life from uni, you're working two jobs and so on. You decided to become a leader, a businessman. Tell us a bit about your journey. How did it all start? What triggered it? I think, I think it wasn't a decision that I made. I think it was just part of the journey. So working the two jobs, I, I worked very hard, very long hours. And then, um, which gave me the opportunity to save up in saving up. By the time I was 22, I, I had saved up enough and my, my then boss of the service station decided he wanted to sell that business. And I was fortunate enough to be able to buy it. So yeah. So, um, so I was fortunate enough that my boss wanted to sell the business. I was, I, I had most of the funding and then he, he funded me for the rest on the basis that I repay him. And I did that. And then, and then the boss that I had at the office, I guess became a bit disgruntled by the fact that I was having my own business and it put tension on our relationship. So from there, I decided to, okay, quit that job. And you know what? As soon as I quit that job, and uh, I guess he made me feel that I wasn't good enough or, you know, still not experienced enough to, to go out on my own, I was headhunted straight away and literally offered a job within a week and it was twice the pay. At that time, I, I gracefully um, I uh, declined that offer and thought, okay, this is where I've got to just work for myself and make this happen. So what worked, did you do then? So I worked very hard, very hard. I, I, I made sure that our service station was to a standard that was impeccable, that gave, that gave no one any reason to come in and say, okay, this operation is running well. Uh, pursued networking, pursued contacting. It took me about two years really to start getting through to people. And this is me calling them on a monthly basis saying, hello, have you got any opportunities? I operate service stations. I'm, you know, I'm good at what I do. This is what I do. Um, and it's always now, not next month. And then finally it cracked and it was, I remember this. It was actually a mobile manager. I called them up and he says, yes, Emil. And I said, oh, okay. And he said, I've got two sides. You know, these sites are just, the, the owners have gone into liquidation. I'll give them to you on one basis. I said, right, he said, just stop calling me every month and we go from here. And that was because I, it was just that persistence, persistence. that I guess overcame his resistance. I had nothing. I was, I was really to everyone. I was no one. I had one site. There's nothing much that I could offer anyone else or prove. So took that on and, and then quickly, um, was fortunate enough to grow this into an empire that, that ranged from Queensland to New South Wales down to Victoria. And, and, you know, we managed that. So, so then I guess it was a matter of stepping up, stepping up because I had never, never had, um, experience in managing an operation of this scale. Yeah. We're, we're talking about 35 sites that we've built up to 37 sites, a big one that we built up to. Uh, across three states. And, um, so yeah, it, it, it really forced me to step up. I guess the most of that, I guess, knowledge or ability or leadership skill came from me rubbing shoulders with successful people that had no, I, I guess they didn't see me as a threat. So they had no problem sharing their wins and their losses, uh, with me. So, which was good. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it seems like IT was never on your plate. Construction, service stations, everything else but IT. What brought IT to your attention? Look, IT was always, well, I beg your pardon, going back, it wasn't IT back then, it was technology, sorry, telecommunications. So telecommunications was always on my radar. I had, I had initially, invested as a seed investor in a in a technology platform and and that was disastrous so the the result was disastrous but i guess 
that didn't hinder me. And uh, I still wanted to do something in the telecommunication space. So I came across some people that knew, knew parts of the telecommunication. I brought these people together and we started the ICT group operation where, where these people would go out and, you know, they're, they're managers, but they'd go out and, you know, source business and, and be able to transact it. So we, we did well for a while and then we started growing. Uh, I, I wasn't spending much time in that business because I was busy doing the other businesses. And then once I started coming into the business, we started to grow the business. And, um, yeah, so that, that, that became, uh, great. And then I think it was about six, seven years ago, we, we decided to transition into the IT space. We saw the, we saw where everything was heading and thought, okay, let's be the leaders of this and try to move across to the IT, mm. get to the, to grow that. And I was fortunate enough to be able to, we, we, we took over two companies. We bought two companies and the capability came with that com- those companies. So we instantly had capabilities that we didn't have previously and, um, and grew from there. Good. So once you made this decision, was it hard to deal uh, with this new environment, the environment of IT and technology? 100%. I thought, you know, from my previous experience where I was, I was managing more than 130 staff, I thought, well, okay, what's a few more staff going to do? It was an absolutely, totally different beast to deal with. Um, the mentality is the difference, the sale, the sales attitude, the sales approach, the sales process, all of that was new. All of that was so different to me. So yes, it was, uh, I, I was never prepared for what was coming up. So how did you overcome, or oh, are you still overcoming this, uh, this challenge until now? Look, uh, Roland, uh, business has always got challenges and they, they, they never cease whether, whether they come in the change of law, they come from, you know, uh, interest rates that things that we can't even control. But they impact businesses. So there's there's many challenges that are out there. I guess it then becomes your approach to it, who you bring on board to help you navigate through these challenges, and you know having the can do attitude, and you know working on that. I, I, I guess that's what gets you through. Otherwise, you know, at the first hurdle, a lot of people would give up and go home because it was just too hard. Okay. Because I know like dealing with IT professionals, it is really challenging. It's a different game and different uh, thinking, different approach. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, time and effort to adjust an environment which has a lot of thinkers and everyone think he's a de- he or she is a decision maker. Did it contradict your, um, did you feel like you've been threatened by these people, um, they're challenging you on a day-to-day basis, or you just uh, use the consultancy as an approach just to progress in your in your business. Look, I, I guess people came in and out of out my life in my professional journey, and and yes, there were there were some people that couldn't see the vision that I had, some people that had their own agenda, some people that, like you said, it's just, it, it was just difficult because everyone, a lot of solutions can be had, but it's just everyone's got their own point of view, had to resolve it. So, yeah, these people, yeah, made it harder, but they also made it easier because I'd always focus on the value they were adding rather than all the problems and noise and everything else. And and there was problems and noise, no doubt. But I guess you've, you've just got to focus on the value they add, take that away, and then move on to the next uh, person and, and, and have that journey so that you're bettering yourself as you go along. Yes, the, the whole idea is you employ people that know more than what you do. And I don't know much about technology, but... It was, it was always the case of getting to know people and yeah, trial and error. Yes, it works. It doesn't work with it's, it's me that couldn't work with or I couldn't work with them or the environment didn't suit or, you know, it didn't happen. It didn't pan out the way they wanted. But at the end of the day, we always take the good out of what these people had to offer and move on to the next journey. So did it force you to change your approach overall or? 100%. Yeah. 100%. Because again, I, I came in not knowing, not not knowing what to expect, and um, 
I, I guess I would never have expected it to be this hard. Mm. Yeah, for someone that that thought he knew management, certainly wasn't at that level. I well, certainly. it does take a lot of courage yeah. just to jump into into any venture that you actually knew little about. So, and when we talk about IT, it comes with a lot of complexity on its own. But this is great. So you started with RCT Group, uh, the business crew. But certainly there was one uh, project or one customer that made that was a turning point um, in your business that gave it a push or um, it took it from one level to another. Would you like to share uh, this part of your? Well, we had a, we had a large customer that that um, was looking at our business and and uh, looking at becoming a client, and they had a requirement which was application development, that we didn't really have the in-house skill to, to provide. But what had happened, they, we, we got the brief of what they wanted and we started gathering the capabilities and making that happen. And that was the inception of our application development arm where we, we made it happen. We, we, we actually um, outshone our competitors or their com- the, the, the people they put forward as competitors and, and were able to win that opportunity and work through it and manage through it. Yes, it was hard. Yes, there were challenges, but the end result, the customer was happy with the outcome and, um, yeah, and, and got what they wanted. Do you still have this customer until now? Yes. That's pretty good. Yes. That's, that's really good. So, um, in IT, normally, Every project is unique. Every customer is unique. They have different requirements, different uh, approach, different interests, different priorities. It's completely different from uh, running a construction site. You can duplicate your building. You can duplicate your petrol station sites. It's exactly the same procedure. Because IT is every, every customer is unique, was it also a challenge for you? Do you feel, did you feel that, oh my God, I have to restart again now or no. how did it work? No, that, that, that wasn't challenging because for me, it was the end result where we achieved customer satisfaction. And, and to me, I was always customer focused and, and I keep telling all my staff, treat them the way you want to be treated. They're, they're paying customers. They've got every right to expect a certain level of whether it's service or whether it's a product. So, yeah, that, that part, yes, the, 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 their needs were varying, but the ultimate outcome was were they satisfied customers? And that was very important to us. That's good. That's pretty good. So, Emil, we all admit that technology is part of us now uh, and has been for many years. And through these many years, it went through a lot of changes. How did you see all of these changes impacted us as humans? Wow. Um, look, uh, I can only comment on what we see, what I see in my own children and, and what you see walking on the street. Uh, I mean, initially the mobile phone was used just to make the calls or receive messages and then, and then started evolving from there. Today, I guess, uh, with all the connectivity that there's around the application, the IoT that's involved, the the phone seems to be an integral part of a lot of people's lives. If you notice, and you know, uh, most people will will agree with this, that the first thing they do in the morning when they wake up, they they open up their eyes and reach for their phone, and sadly, the last thing they put down when before they sleep is their phone. So the phone starts becoming an integral part of their life and it's around there and technology is taking us there. The, the applications are taking us there. The, the AI, you know, uh, how it's evolving, it's, it's taking us there. So do you feel that we are guarded now by technology rather than using technology for our needs? Well, uh, that's a hard question because, hard question. You, you know, I mean, guarded. To what extent are you being guarded? Because there's a lot of people that threaten our networks, our security, our cyber security out there. So how are we targeted? Um, the, I, I guess the value that has changed over the years. First, it was money that was worth a lot of things, uh, you know, were, had the value. Now it's data. So how are we protected? 
yeah when people are just trying endlessly and and again not not physically trying themselves but having robots and ai sitting there trying to crack your passwords in order to you know get your data and whether they sell it whether they utilize it for whatever illegal activities yeah, to say protected, I think that was the wrong word. I think that's the wrong approach to it. But we seem to be guided. And yes, there's there's positives to that where you see my elderly mother now. You know, if she needs anything, she's got, you know, the mobile phone handy. She can just quickly press a couple of buttons and she's connected to her that she needs to connect to and, and she's got video calling. She, you know, she went through a phase where, you know, she didn't see her late father. Yeah, because it was all uh, via communication via letters. Mm. Now it's, you know, sharing, sharing videos and, and having video calls. So look, there's benefits to it and there's the other side to it. So going back to Emil, what, what would Emil do if his phone goes off for, I don't know, 24 hours? Look, uh, I, I'm blessed enough to have good people working for me where my phone is not integral part of my life yes i need to be connected yes i need to stay connected with them my phone is on 24 hours a day because of the businesses that we operate but um as you see now it doesn't ring often because i've got good people that look after or do they basically do their job and by doing their job they're taking the pressure off me and i can do my job do you follow up on social media? Do you, do you have your opinion? You raise your opinion. You share with no. I'm I'm more of a person that sits there and and spies and and watches it, but does not take part. Of it. Why is that? Um, I guess I'm I'm quite indifferent to a lot of things. Um, I'm quite acceptable of accepting of a lot of things. So I guess. I don't need to form that kind of opinion and 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 let it be out there because it impacts whether it impacts my children, it impacts you know the people I'm doing business with. I'm I'm I guess I'm a, quite a a a reserved person and don't want to be seen out there. Reserved person for someone who is a businessman and who runs a lot of businesses. How can you be reserved? Um, I learned this very early in my days, Roland, where, where because I had service stations with two competing oil companies, they come up and ask me, do you have any other service stations? I'd say no. And so they didn't know my business. People didn't know who I was. Yeah, I was running quite a large operation. And it was always just the fact that you were flying under the radar and you didn't need that kind of, you know, a tall poppy syndrome in Australia is quite common. And I didn't need to be, you know, challenged with people's opinions or trying to pull us down or expose us to the oil companies. So we, we, we sort of kept our heads down and, and worked hard and without letting people know exactly what we were doing, what we owned, what we were operating so that it just didn't affect our business. Do you get involved in politics at all? No. Do you vote? Yes. Why would you do that? Look, I, I mean, I understand what every party's got to offer and then I'll make a choice what suits me as a businessman for my family. So it's not just all about the business. It's also about family values. It's everything else. So it's me putting a voice in. That's good. So look, as a businessman and uh, someone who runs an IT venture, do you think Australia plays a role in uh, future development of technology around the world? Have you ever thought about it from this perspective? I've, I've, I've seen what there is overseas. I've seen what, I, I guess, the grants that are available for people to start up and have think tanks and things like that. No, I'd say we're, we're behind the world. We, we tend to adopt things a lot slower than the rest of the world. Um, uh, I mean, in the most recent study about cybersecurity, I think, uh, Australia and Singapore were, were rated as, uh, the least to take up cybersecurity compared to the rest of the world. And we are, we are behind the, the game of the rest of the world. What is the reason for that? Do you think is it people in Australia overall or look? 
I, I guess people can say that about fashion. People can say that about everything that we do. I don't know if it's distance. I don't know if it's the fact that, yeah, we, we're isolated. So we don't have the volumes that they have overseas, uh, as in population volume. Um, you know, our, the, the population of Australia is 25 million over this vast land. Whereas you get that in cities overseas. So I, I, I guess that makes a difference to how people can, you know, go in, promote or, or release, uh, technology or, you know, apps. So what do you see next for technology? What do you think will happen? Just look at the moment. I think, uh, the reality is and, uh, and the fear is, is the cyber security issue. Um, and, and, and we see that very, it's very common. And, and we're starting to see that even in the conflicts between countries, that, that plays a part and that can have really dire, uh, consequences on either party. So I, I think cybersecurity is an issue because the, it's, it's a growing industry. People are being well rewarded for it, sadly. And, and so, so there, there's, there's more and more people getting into that field and trying to benefit from it. I, I, I think that's, that's, an, you know, that's, that's one thing, but then there's AI, which is helping us to deal with situations and solving a lot of our issues at the moment where, you know, culturally we've changed. People have been, you know, uh, changing with the environment. And so, you know, our, uh, the fact that, you know, we can get personal, uh, um, personal protection through, through, whether it's the mobility or, or whatever device we use, that people are being able to be protected, whether they're sleeping, whether they fall off the bed, whether there's AI that now measures all of this and allows people to attend to that situation rather than have the people sit there or fall there or lie there without until they're found. Just going back to whatever you stated before, um, as a businessman, do you, are you ready just to invest in any development, in any uh, future product development in Australia that would benefit the whole Australian society? Um, funny you say that because we actually are in the process of negotiating a master license for, for a product that is a seed product that we've invested in and that, um, you know, we feel is a solution that will really suit um, the market and not just the Australian market, but the world market. All we're focusing on at the moment is the Australian market because it, 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 it really has benefits that, um, that our clients and end users will end up, uh, I guess, reaping. So which segment of the market do you think it needs most now? As in what investment or? As investment in development, in creating new products, in assisting people in. Again, I, I, I'd honestly say to you, Cyber. Because we, we, we feel, I mean, some of us, some of the businesses feel, oh, we're too small to be targeted. And these people are now targeting individuals, let alone small business. Now, with the fact that the laws have changed, where, you know, you as a business, you've got a responsibility to protect your data. A lot of people think, no, I'm a, as a business, I'm only, whether it's a, a single man operation or person operation, I beg your pardon, to, to, you know, many employees. They feel, oh no, we, we, we're not big enough to be targeted. And, and no, there are, again, there are consequences for, for those kind of breaches because the, the law states now that you will be held personally responsible for, for the breaches that happen. Excellent. We didn't talk much about your family, but I'd love just to open this door. Um, and start talking about your family. You've got three kids, three beautiful kids. God I'm blessed to have them. Thank you. But you're a busy man. You're a businessman. You run many businesses. You hardly sleep. I know that. Um, how do you keep the balance between your family life and running many businesses? Look, I'm, uh, Roland, I'm, I'm blessed to have beautiful children and, um, and, and the way we brought them up, the way, you know, they were, they were, they were brought up in a loving environment. So they understand and, and, and I guess it's just making sure that they're my, they are my pride and joy. So I put that first. 
whatever whatever their needs are, whatever, you know, and obviously I have to invest the time in them, as I do with my mother, my own mother, and I care for my mother. So um, that that's my first priority. And then everything after that, whether we have to have dinner together or we spend, you know, uh, a day together, after that, they, I mean, they're, they're teenagers now, so they, they've got their own, um, uh, things to do, I guess, with their friends. So once, once that, you know, our time together has come to an end, I, I then hop on my laptop and do my work wherever I, I am. And that's, that's the way I usually do things, whether I work till the early hours of the morning, but I get my work done and, and like I said, I'm blessed to have people that do their jobs that make my job a lot easier. So what is your message to all of these businessmen out there who do have families and businesses at the same time? What did you learn so far in your life? What comes first, business or family? Look, it has to be family. There's nothing like reaping the rewards of, you know, a loving family. You can offer people millions trillions and if they think that can make them happy for how long yet to to sit there and see your children you know growing up and 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 yeah moving navigating through life yeah and be able to guide them and be able to assist i I guess to me as as emil nader um i feel that our religion states that it's it's all about the family and and i believe that because i feel that that's what was you know, passed on to me from my father, and that's the least that I could do for my children because at the end of the day, everyone's got the opportunity to make money, lose money. Everyone goes through those phases. But to have a family that's loving and and supportive and around you through your good times, through your bad times, Mm. amazing. It is amazing. Any of your kids work with you in in the RT segment at all? Uh, No. I, I didn't want to sit there and direct them through it, even though they, they've they sort of hinted at it, but I wanted them to go out and spread their wings and experience the world, experience so, the world with an employer other than their father protected. So was it a personal choice or was it something that you didn't want your kids to be in? in it? Oh, no, not at all. I, uh, uh, I sat down and discussed uh, why with my children. My second um, eldest, uh, he came and worked with me at a bad time. It was when COVID had first hit. He, he worked with me in the IT, uh, cause he would, he, he felt that he would enjoy IT. He worked with me for six months during COVID, which was very hard for someone who, who was, you know, being trained over video conference, listening in over, there was no human interaction. So then I, I guess he, he worked out that that really wasn't for him it was boring and yes it was look it's hard when video uh conferences and all that they they take a bit more effort than a face-to-face meeting so so then he decided and and he approached me and said dad would you be disappointed i said dad you can try out for a hundred jobs as long as you find where you know something that you're passionate about nothing would make me happy and i'm blessed enough that both of my boys have um become carpenters Carpenters. Yes. Away from technology and IT. Yes, but they saw the opportunity in construction and what we can do. And um, ultimately, uh, one of them wants to become a builder. So, yeah, I couldn't be happier. As long as they're happy doing what they do, and, and they are, that's all I matters to me. That's beautiful. So are they convinced that they need to use technology to market their business and so on? You, have you and ever discussed that with them? And they do, that. and they are. And they are because my eldest son's got his own business now and he's trying to get, you know, referrals and, and, and job opportunities. And he knows that he can only do that through social media. So I, I see him quite active on the social media side where I do like, um, his do you post. Follow him? I, do you, I, I do follow you like him and I like you. Please his like my so, too. You <laughs> yes. So, um, so yeah, so I see that he's doing that. He's trying to, you know, do a few things with Google in, in the local area. So again, to promote himself and get job opportunities, which is great. That's fantastic. Look, Emil, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on our platform today and having, um, and actually hearing your beautiful story in the engagement in the world of IT. Before we wrap it up, 
What is your advice to the young dreamers who would love to just to start a business in IT and technology? Look, um, to me, there's no shame in trying. Give it a go. Everyone can succeed. This is the land of opportunity. We're very blessed to be here. That everyone has the chance. I was, you know, a very poor person. My parents were very poor, but we're blessed because we worked hard. It takes hard work. It's not just having the vision and then wanting everyone else to do the work. You've got to roll up your sleeves, do the work, and you will, whether you 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 achieve it through gaining experience, knowledge, whatever it is, it's not a failure. It's not a failure. Where you might fail financially, but then you've gained all this knowledge that you 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 move on to your next project or the next goal. So to me, everything and, and all you have to do is work hard and you will achieve. Correct. From a young boy watching his dad struggle to survive to becoming a successful entrepreneur is a story of courage and ambition. Countless individuals like Emil are out there pursuing their dreams and striving to make a positive impact. So take that leap of faith, aim high, and never stop believing in your potential. Until our next story, keep on dreaming big. Thank you, Emil. Thank you. Very impressive. Very impressive. Honestly, you you made me feel comfortable. I was I was uncomfortable in because I'm out of my element, but you honestly made me feel comfortable and and the conversation just flowed. Quite impressive. Previously on Brain Splat. And whatnot and the connection with that and technology. But motivation was always of interest to me and I was always curious on how people make decisions, just how we decide what to do, what not to do. And then that kind of got me into the corporate world. I uh, started working with um, different elements.